Hello. My question to you today is, when is right wrong? Elijah had done some mighty exploits for the Lord. In fact, he was at his zenith when Jezebel came after him. Elijah had challenged the 850 prophets Queen Jezebel had been sponsoring during a great famine to prove how powerful Baal was. The contest was that he and the prophets of Baal were both to build an altar to their God and pray. And the God that answered by fire would be declared to be the real God. You know the story. The Baal worshippers prayed from morning till evening, even cutting themselves with knives to get Baal's attention, but did nothing but exhaust themselves. Elijah prepared the altar of the Lord, which had been broken down, put the sacrifice on the altar, then doused it with 12 buckets of water so that the water filled the troughs beneath the altar. That in itself would be almost a criminal act in a famine. Then he said one short prayer and immediately fire came down from heaven, licked up all the water in the troughs and consumed the sacrifice, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jehovah was the real God. He then commanded the Israelite onlookers to destroy those false prophets and they did. Jezebel was fuming. She swore she'd do to him what he'd done to her prophets. And so he ran for his life. If there's one thing this present situation has exposed to me, it's a lack of understanding or faith in those whom I expected to be strong. Morris and I felt an impulse to visit a couple. 50 miles away. We didn't tell them beforehand, we just arrived on their doorstep. But we were amazed to find them afraid to allow us entry into their home. I did manage to get inside as I said I needed the loo, but I didn't get a hug or a handshake. And they made us sit with our coats on outside in their back garden whilst they spoke to us from inside their kitchen doorway as they were lawfully keeping a social distance. Well, we left them and visited another couple who lived close by. But the contrast was stark. They both ran out to greet us with bear hugs and almost dragged us into their house as they'd been starved for fellowship. What a blessed time we had with them, talking about God for hours, praying and sharing communion together. Yeah, even from the same glass. It was wonderful. We went our 50 miles journey home praising God because we had been up front and close with fear and faith in reality. And it was as contrasting as darkness and light. I saw a, uh, sorry, I saw a post on Facebook which made my heart sing. It gave me such encouragement as I imagine that's just how Elijah felt when the Lord told him he wasn't the only one who was serving him. There were another 7,000 who hadn't bowed the knee. I'd seen and been encouraged by the couple who stood up for what they believed. But this post was from a pastor whom we'd met during our last visit to New York. And it thrilled me to bits because he was encouraging people to stand up for what they believed and read the Bible to see how many people opposed the ruling of their day in order to please God. Many years ago, I wrote a song entitled, Will the real Christians please stand up, stand up and be counted? And years later, Morris used this title for his book in the Radical Christianity series, where he preaches the radical lifestyle Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I believe it's time for God's people to stand up for what they believe and be counted. You know, Christians blindly obey those in authority at all costs because they have a very distorted view of certain scriptures. For instance, they quote this, Romans 13, verses 3 to 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. Well, meeting with other believers is not evil. 
In fact, it's a commandment of God. Abortion's evil, but the powers that be have legalised it. Sexual acts which contravene the Bible are evil, but these have also been legalised and even promoted in schools. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. To obey God often brings us into conflict with ruling authorities because Satan is running this world and he has an agenda to rid the world of anything to do with God. Would have had no Moses if his mother had obeyed the authority when he was born. She should have handed him over to be killed. But instead she hid him. She was honoured for her deceit. Rahab the harlot hid the, uh, the Israelite spies and lied to the authorities saying that they'd already left her house when in actual fact they were still hiding on her rooftops under the, under the flats. And because of this, she saved her whole household from slaughter when the Israelites invaded Jericho. Her bravery even brought her into Israel and she's actually named in the lineage of Jesus. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego disobeyed the king, even though they were high-ranking officials in the government. They should have bowed to a statue, but refused and stood out above all the other Israelites in captivity who were in service to the king, but submitted. They didn't get away with it. They were put in a fiery furnace. But look at their tremendous testimony of deliverance because they put God first. Daniel purposely disobeyed the authority. The whole of Babylon was instructed not to pray to any other god but the king. But Daniel didn't even disobey in secret. He prayed blatantly in front of an open window and wouldn't deviate from his daily devotions. Even though the penalty for refusing to obey was being thrown into a den of lions. But look at his victorious testimony too. Peter was beaten and spent time in prison for preaching. And when he was released, he was straightly charged by the rulers over God's people not to preach in the name of Jesus. But he disobeyed. And the very next day, he was found in the temple doing exactly what he'd been forbidden to do. The early church disobeyed the law uh, of the day by assembling. For over 1,000 years, churches not authorised by Roman Catholicism were violating the law to meet. In Muslim countries, the penalty for converting to Christianity is death. Yet we praise those who risk their lives to preach Jesus to these people. You know, Morris and I, together with many other passionate believers, have disobeyed the law by smuggling Bibles into Russia and other atheistic countries. If caught, we too could have been imprisoned. Yet people praised and funded our actions. People have harboured Jews in the last wars. And we think that they did a wonderful service for the Lord. Yet they broke the law to do it. And if found, they were shot. You know, the only authority that is unlimited is God. All other authorities, including governments, were given limits by God. But when they step outside of those limits, their authority is no longer valid for a God-fearing believer. In fact, when the Nazi officials were brought before the courts for war criminals, they could have argued that they were only obeying orders. But we know that this wouldn't have been a plea. Many were executed for doing what was wrong, even though they were calling it right. We'll all have to give an account for our actions. And as Peter and the other apostles said in Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. You know, we've seen nothing yet in our Western countries of what it could be like in the near future. I've just received this report from the people we support in Uganda of what they're having to cope with. Times are hard for so many people here. They are in a dilemma. As they struggle to put food on the table, they are arrested for either breaking the curfew or opening up for work or working behind the door, yet the food isn't reaching them. You can't believe it's even a crime to give someone food. And some have been arrested for giving out food. Government says, if you have food to donate, 
take it to the Prime Minister's office for health officials to give it out. But that food never gets to the people. And that besides, transport is banned. I wonder how they expect people to take food all the way there. People come to me in starves. I have to look out to be sure I won't be found out. And I strictly tell them not to disclose to anyone that I gave them food. I used to hear about smuggling Bibles in Russia. Never thought at any time that there will ever be a need to smuggle food. Well, God has been protecting us. Last week, I and Matthias couldn't help it breaking curfew as I had to return from a funeral service of one of us. The long distance couldn't allow us back in time. I prayed for God's help. I was a long way, but we found no law enforcement officers on the way. Thousands have been imprisoned due to breaking curfew. Many beaten, some maimed, some died in custody, and some shot at and either wounded or killed as they refused to stop when security tried to stop them. I see people so frustrated that they've reached a level of doing anything. Looks like many young people don't even fear death anymore. It's a messed up world we live in these latter days. The other day, the Speaker of Parliament, who is also a member of the ruling party, brought it out so well. She was complaining of the millions of dollars that those in authority have been allocated in the name of classified expenditures, yet it was for their stomachs, for the majority of people are starving. She said, no one cares about Ugandans. We in the West have not been oppressed like the third world nations. But the days are coming when the whole world will be under this kind of control. In Jeremiah 12 verse 5 it says this, If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend or keep up with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the swelling of Jordan? That's when it's not just raining but it's flooding have you any idea where all this is heading jesus lived 30 years without anyone having any notion of who he was he was the village carpenter whom the bible says grew in favor with god and man but one day his time came for him to reveal himself he spoke a few words in his local synagogue about the spirit of the Lord being upon him to preach the gospel, saying that this day, this scripture was fulfilled in their ears. And he mentioned a couple of instances of Elijah being sent to help the Gentiles rather than the Israelites. The whole place erupted. Those who heard what he said were so angry that they didn't only throw him out of the synagogue, they threw him out of the city up to the brow of the very hill on which their city was built, intending to throw him down headlong. If there hadn't been a divine intervention, they would have killed Jesus before he'd even started his ministry. It was the same with John the Baptist. For 30 years he'd lived in obscurity in the wilderness, eating locusts and wild honey. But one day he made a public appearance and started telling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Many people were convicted by this message and tried to get right with God. But John didn't pull any punches. Neither did he curry favour with the rich and famous. He spoke truth to anyone and everyone, paupers and royalty alike. And it's because he spoke truth to the king about his adulterous marriage that Herod's wife made sure he lost his head. The Bible says that all who will live godly shall suffer persecution. You know, I don't like the idea of persecution any more than you. But there's a cost to being a disciple, which means we have to train to be soldiers. And it's easy to keep yourself from being persecuted. You just lie low and you stay indoors. Nobody will need to imprison you because you've imprisoned yourself already. In the third world, People are used to hardships and suffering. They've been trodden down for a long time. But if the threat of a virus or just the threat of a reprimand or fine, which is all you'll get in this country, if that scared you, then you should ask yourself, 
how you're going to cope with, uh, with the next and stronger test. And it'll surely come. So my question to you is, whose authority have you truly submitted to? When did right become wrong?